Oh my God. There are two dogs standing up on the top of a roof, 20 metres high. On this episode of Bondi Vet. As soon as we hear an owner say that their dog might have a tick, we get them in straight away. Kate's on the hunt for a tiny parasite with a deadly bite. A lot of these dogs, even 50% of them, with treatment die. And here's this gorgeous beast. This is Athena. Scott's farm vet skills are put to the test. Part of the stomach that's here needs to go over there. Yeah. In a confronting emergency. So that is, that's, that's frightening. <laughs> and Lisa fears for this tiny Pomeranian. It's a big dog's jaw, it's just gone right around him. After it was crushed in another dog's jaw. We might just be dealing with the tip of the iceberg. Come on, there's your girl. I can depend on you. On Hospital, you're speaking with Natalie. In Sydney, receptionist Natalie is taking an urgent call from a worried owner. No worries, you can bring Blue down ASAP and we'll check out the tick. Thank you, bye. As soon as we hear an owner say that their dog might have a tick, we get them in straight away. They're really very, very dangerous. Okay, how are you doing, okay, miss? Time is critical. Bluey's mum, Hunter, fears she's found a tick hidden in the Bordoodle puppy's shaggy coat. So our concerns with her having a tick is that obviously they can have really adverse effects for dogs. We've had friends that have had kind of, you know, unfortunate situations with ticks and their dogs. Eight-month-old Blue and her family have just returned from a camping trip on the coast. There you go, sweetheart. So I'll just get you to hang on to her that side. There you go, darling. It's all right, sweetheart. It's OK. It's OK, darling. This is a really serious situation and you haven't noticed any clinical signs. She's been very tired but she's also been doing a lot of running around on the beach. So we thought she was just tired from that. Let me just grab a quick tick remover, hang on. Ticks in Australia are not like ticks overseas. There are multiple types, so in particular there's bush ticks and brown dog ticks. But the most deadly of all, and the most common, is the paralysis tick. Okay, so around about here I can feel something. So I found a tick. That's the most important thing is, is just to remove the tick. Let's not lose him. What I want to try and establish is, is he alive or is he dead? So I know from looking at Blue's history that she's had a preventative that's supposed to last three months and it's been given around about two months. So technically speaking, there should be enough coverage in that tick preventative to have killed this tick. So this is what we're looking at down this microscope. It's definitely a paralysis tick and it's definitely dead. But Blue is not in the clear just yet. Ticks are a little bit like snakes in that when they attach, they obviously secrete their venom. Mm -hmm. And often people pull them off and say, oh, like we removed it and it was fine. And I was like, no, but the venom is still in there. Yeah. If her preventative has not been strong enough, Blue's body may already be under attack. Let's just have a look at these pupils. So you can see those pupils constrict beautifully. They're not overly dilated. 120, which is great. A lot of these dogs, even 50% of them with treatment die. Without treatment, 90% easily die. It's been really bad this summer. Yeah. It's been really bad. I think up at North Shore at the moment they're sitting at about 150 they've had. And 143 of them weren't on any tick prevention. I'm just so grateful that we were. So far, Blue isn't showing any signs of poisoning, but she will need to be closely watched for the next 72 hours. See, the first sign that you see is them start to get a little bit wobbly on their back legs. The other thing that's really important is they often have a change in voice. Yep. Um, and should we bring her in if we notice any signs? You definitely. Yeah. You need to like literally be like, oh my goodness, Kate, like something's going on. But Blue's mum Hunter is running late to teach yoga, while husband Matt is still out catching waves. Thank you guys so much. Is it possible for her to stay here for five minutes till my husband gets home? Totally. Because he's surfing and I have to totally. go straight to work. Totally. To him. Luckily, Dr Kate is happy to do some doggy sitting until Blue can be reunited with her relieved dad. Are you just back from the surf? Is that all right if you just pop down and pick her up? Come on, let's go. Good job.
Yeah, don't worry. Your dad is coming to pick you up shortly. Come on, Bluey. <gasps> There's your dad. It's exciting. Oh, come here. Oh. Come here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have a good surf? I did, yeah. <laughs> I came back. Blue was supposed to be there because we're trying to leave her by herself now. And I was walking the house, I was waiting for her to run out. And I'm like, where is she? <laughs> yeah, I'm really relieved that the tick kind of came off really easily. And it seems like there was no real venom is what they said. I'm really happy with how this has gone today. The tick is off and that is the main thing. Bye, Blue. See ya. Thanks, see ya. Thanks so I'll, much. I'll see Dave. you again. Not too soon, I hope. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. Call me if you need me. <laughs> yeah, will do. Bye. Bye, Blue. Blue. All right, let's go. Scott's now taking a break from his London practices and heading west to Wales to polish up his skills as a farm vet. I'm really excited to be heading out to West Wales again. The people that live out here are absolutely awesome. They're so down to earth and they're really dedicated to the animals that they look after. So I'm honoured actually that they've asked me to come out and help. Scott's first stop will be the historic town of St Clair's. Now, last time I was here, I really had to earn my stripes as a farm vet, doing things that I haven't done since my uni days. It's got a lovely temperament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we'll make a farm vet of you yet, Scott. <laughs> Welcome to Wales. <laughs> this time, I'm going to have to step up another level because it's all hands on deck. The vets are so busy this time of year, so I just hope that I can keep up with the pace. Scott will be based at the Market Hall Practice, which looks after local pets as well as animals at surrounding farms, and he's checking in with head vet David Stark. Morning, David. Good morning. How are you? Good to see yeah, you again. Great. So what have we got planned? Uh, lots of lots of carvings, lots of sheep, lots of cattle, hopefully lots of horses. Yeah, those lined up for, for the week, Scott. All right, well, I've got some overalls in the car, I promise. So oh, great. Good. Should I go and chuck them on? Yes. Awesome. Great one. Nice one, Dave. Good okay, to see Scott. you. Cheers. Scott's being put straight to work after a call about an emergency at a local dairy farm. A Jersey cattle owner has called to say that one of her girls is very sick. All we know is that this poor girl isn't eating and she does have a calf. Scott will be working under the guidance of vet Vicky. Right, time to get okay. suited up. Yep. She deals with big farm animals on a daily basis. What do we need? But Scott hasn't done any major procedures on a cow since his university days. Oh my goodness, here we go. Waiting anxiously is dairy farmer Helen. She's worried about her much-loved cow, Athena, who's recently become a new mum. She just looks generally miserable um, and not happy with life. We never have problems with calving the jerseys. So I'm a little bit nervous. Hi, I'm Scott, how are Hi, you? I'm Helen, how are Hi, you? Hi, Helen. And here's this gorgeous beast. This is Athena. Athena. Very beautiful. Right, so what are the issues that you've been having with your cow? Um, she's been calved just under a week, and we've noticed the last few days um, that she hasn't really been eating as much as I'd like her to. She just looked a little bit depressed. Right. First thing, uh, let's have a little listen to her heart. That's all clear, so I'll just listen to her stomach. Oh, do you want to have a listen? There's not a huge amount of noise going no, on in there. it's quite quiet. Yeah. That rumen's not moving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 so it's just not functioning no. at the moment. Yeah. All I can hear is complete silence, and that's a real concern. The four stomachs inside a cow should make a lot of noise, and when they don't, that's a worry. I believe that this cow might be suffering with a condition known as left displacement of the abomasum, or LDA. It's basically where one of the four stomachs is twisted and can commonly happen after a cow has had a calf. The way that LDA is diagnosed is by using percussion, so basically tapping on the side of the abdomen of the cow. You hear it? Oh, wow, yeah, there. there. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. 
That is a lot different to the surrounding area. It's very distinctive sound, isn't it? Yeah. We can hear a very tinny sound, which basically sounds like a, a bag, which is the abomasum, filled with gas. It's, so it sounds a little bit like a drum. So pretty much part of the stomach that's here needs to go over there. Yeah. And the only way to do that is by reaching in. Um, pulling it back. Pulling it out. Athena at the moment's uncomfortable and she isn't eating and she will lose weight quickly. So we need to intervene with this surgery. First, Scott and Vicky need to release the trapped gas before moving the stomach back into place. Good to go? Yep. The procedure will be performed through an incision made in Athena's side. So I'm always nervous when surgery is involved in any animal. We haven't had a huge amount of them done here either. So from an owner's point of view, it's, it's a little bit nervous to watch it happen, yeah. I can just feel across. I can feel a nice big stomach on the other side. Right. So now we're going to deflate the uh, stomach. So this is Deflated. quite a dangerous moment, really, isn't it? Vicky? Yeah, this is quite a big needle. And the idea is we want to just take the needle across, put it straight into the abomasum mm -hmm. and get the air out. Back in my uni days, we learned about farm animal stuff, but it's about 20 years ago. So I do need to refresh my skills with these fantastic farm animal vets. So mm -hmm. if you're going to stab anything, stab yourself. Right. <laughs> so you want to okay. take that? Yeah. So guard it. I just want to keep that on there and guard it with my life. Yep. All right, Athena, you can trust me, sweetie. So round, round the intestines. Oh, my goodness. That is actually quite hard to do. Yeah. Without stabbing yourself. Yeah. So once we open up the cow, you're going in blind. It's just experience and knowing what's normal and navigating under and round quite important bits of anatomy. And then? Put just straight in. Straight in. As far as you can. Okay. And then it's going in now. There we are. So the gas that comes out, that's basically fermented grass. That's what they're eating at the moment. And it's sat there for a good couple of days. So it's quite rancid to kind of smell, really. My heart is actually going. Doing that. <laughs> so that is, that's, that's frightening, is uh, performing a procedure like that, a massively sharp needle around this poor girl's organs. Protect the needle, bring it back out. Okay. Yep. Okay, please don't move. Okay. <laughs> Good girl. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Brilliant. Oh, man. <laughs> Fingers intact? Fingers intact. <laughs> Cows intact. With the gas removed, the stomach now has to be manipulated back into its correct position. So what Vic and I have been able to do is to retrieve the abomasum, which was uh, over on the left-hand side where it shouldn't be, pulled it underneath and then up, and now Vicky's busily lassoing it to this right-hand side of the cow. And what that does is means a little bit of scar tissue will form. It'll stick the stomach where it should be on the right-hand side, and hopefully it'll never flip where it shouldn't go again. So, so yeah, pull that tight. It's nicely attached to that attached there. wall. So just need to ditch the skin. The suturing of a cow is uh, actually really quite difficult because what we're suturing is leather. So it's very thick and uh, very tough to get through. But uh, at the same time, you want to get a nice, pretty result so that the farmer's happy, just like our owners back at Richmond. All right, last one, sweetheart, last one. That's it. Yeah, all zipped up. Very nice. Lovely. Right. An antibiotic spray completes Athena's treatment. Great. Good job. Athena is immediately looking so much brighter. She just looks like a different cow already. I was really happy with how Scott and Vicky worked together to get it done. So it went really well. You couldn't have gone any better. Before Scott leaves, he wants to see how Athena's six-day-old calf is coping without his mum. This is Athena's son, Achilles. Hello, mate. Oh, hello, beautiful. Whilst mummy was getting surgery, you didn't get your breakfast, did you? Hey, no, you didn't. Here we go, you gonna have some? There you go. There's the good stuff right there. Yeah, oh, yummy. Boy. It's been a really incredible day today to be able to work alongside Vicky and to help Athena, and now to feed this adorable little youngster. It's been a great end to an absolutely perfect day, and now I can see the benefits of being a farm vet. Pretty nice, really. Well, they seem to enjoy that, and hopefully Athena will be able to do the job moving forward. Yeah, she's already looking a lot brighter, so hopefully he'll be back in with her tomorrow morning, hopefully, to just have a little bit of a, a sack, and then she can go out with the rest of the cows then. Yeah, unless you want to come home with me, eh? Eh? Yeah.
In Sydney, Layla and Stuart have arrived at the Bondi Referral Hospital SASH with six-year-old Shiva. The little Pomeranian is in extreme pain after being mauled by two large dogs at a local park. It was horrible. He screams as soon as you put him down or pick him up or you know, touch him in a new place, he screams. Um, so we don't really know what's, what's going on with him. All right, pop him down on the table. We'll have a look at him. Hey, Shiva. One dog picked him up. Um, and the other bit him when he tried to run off. And... OK. When a small dog who's three kilos, like Shiva, has been picked up by a 20-plus kilo dog, shaken around by the neck, there's a potential for some massive crushing injuries, some massive internal injuries that we don't even see from the outside. Just checking for a broken jaw or anything like that, so that's, that feels good. Mouth looks OK. Good thing is he's moving air really nicely through his chest, which is very, very good. It's shocked as well. <laughs> OK, honey, you're all right. You look at Shiva and he doesn't look too bad, but you touch him and he screams. This little dog is absolutely terrified and in a lot of pain. Let's pop him on the ground and see what he can do. Shiva, 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 darling? I've got to pick you up. I don't deal with the animal being in pain very well at all. I'm a big wuss like that. Big, big wuss. There's a bit of bruising there, yeah. you see? Yeah. And then you can see over here, um, it's much redder. So I think we should shave him. What we'll do today is we'll start off with just some blood tests to make sure everything's OK, there's no major internal bleeding, and then taking some x-rays of him and see what we can see. Oh, he's so sore. What really bothers me is that he's in a lot of pain, and we might just be dealing with the tip of the iceberg when we look at his skin. Lisa is hoping x-rays will give her some answers to the extent of Shiva's injuries. Shiva's looking pretty lucky at the moment. There's no obvious broken ribs, there's no broken bones that I can see, there's no sign of lung collapse, uh, no sign of bleeding, which would show up as patchy white areas. It could have been a lot worse. Wow. Even though the x-rays are all clear, it's not the end of it. Shiva's got puncture wounds, he's got bacteria under his skin, he could develop a really nasty infection. Oh, poor little thing. That has got to hurt. No wonder he screams every time we touch his chest. So you can see his puncture wounds are just all over here, so it's a big dog's jaw, it's just gone right around him. All right, so we're just going to give him some antibiotics. You OK? Good boy. Just done. Oh, it's all done. It's OK. It's OK. It's done. done. OK. Oh, 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 it's done. It's nothing compared. It's, it's nothing so compared to your bruising, sweetie pie. Hey, you're brave like a lion. Look at that. you got a mane. Because we haven't got anything firmly wrong with him besides bruising and puncture wounds, all we can do is monitor him and treat him with antibiotics and pain relief. And a nice sleep. I really, really hope that he doesn't develop any really deep infections and hope that he doesn't deteriorate. Have a good little rest, all right? Good boy. Sorry. <laughs> Shiva, you want to stand up? You mean Shiva? And Shiva is now having an ultrasound after blood tests showed an abnormal reading. Oh, sweetheart, I know. Honey. So one of Shiva's liver enzymes is increased, so that can mean that he's had some trauma to his liver. So we're doing an abdominal ultrasound just to check all the organs inside his abdomen. Here's the liver. It's looking really good. There are no blood clots. There are no areas of abnormality. Very healthy. Wonderful. He's a lucky boy. I can't believe that that's all he's got. Skin bruising. Shiva's got a little bit of bruising in his liver, but not even enough that we can see on an ultrasound, just enough that we can see on a blood test. And that's about it. He's a lucky boy. Do you want to go home? Hey, let's go. Yeah, see you, buddy. Layla and Stuart have arrived with Shiva's best mate, Bandit. I'm excited and nervous and all these emotions at once. That I don't know what to feel. <laughs> Bandit's been so sad and just, just seems lost. Last time he saw Shiva, he was dying pretty much, so he doesn't know what, what's happened to him. Mm. 
You won't believe who's around the corner. Look who's there. Hey. Mummy. Hey, Bubby. Hey, buddy. Hey, Bubby. Thanks. That was such a sweet reunion. As soon as he saw Layla, he knew it was Mum and he's licking her all over her face. It was gorgeous. Thank you. He's really doing well, so my advice is just get back out there. Definitely. Just, you know, it's always hard for owners who've seen attacks and our own pets injured yeah. that we tend to want to wrap them in cotton wool and every time a dog comes up to him you might start to panic but the best thing you can do is try and be as normal as possible yeah yep yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you so much no problem at all where are these new babies there they are. Hello, Mum and Dad. Oh, you can settle down, it's all right. Where are these little chicks? At the Australian Reptile Park, General Manager Tim Faulkner is concerned about some highly anticipated new arrivals. I know there's two chicks. I saw them early this morning. Right now they're under Dad. These tiny bundles are just six hours old. They're extremely rare bushstone curlews. They used to be pretty common and widespread throughout New South Wales and Victoria. New South Wales now, they're in danger. They're almost gone. On the central coast where I live, uh, there's six pairs. There should be hundreds. Breeding programs are now essential to the bushstone curlew's survival. But Tim suspects the latest arrivals are starving. There's a known problem with curlews in captivity, and that is that they are wonderful parents. They try and defend and protect and feed their chicks, but Something goes wrong, and lots of curly chicks die in captivity if they're left with their parents. So what I'm going to do is scatter some food around, and what I want to see is mum and dad come back, they're just there now, is come back and start and pick up. And the chicks should come along and take that from mum and dad. That's what would normally happen. After giving the adults a helping hand, Tim is desperate to see them mimicking what they do in the wild. I've not seen any of the behaviours I wanted to see. Mum and Dad have had a pick at feed, but they've not presented anything to the chicks. The chicks are hungry, they need a lot of food. Without food, the chicks will perish. I don't know what happens with curlews, I don't know why that block's there. They're wonderful parents, they're defending the chicks, they're calling and they're following them. It's just that block with feed. Tim has had to make the heartbreaking decision to remove the chicks for their own survival. The main concern is that if I don't do this, I could come in tomorrow and there are no chicks. I'm going to make it as quick as possible. But the protective parents aren't happy. OK, hey, settle down, guys. Tim knows they simply can't feed their babies. There we go. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Wow. And these two little curly chicks. Have you ever seen anything as beautiful as that? It's pretty sad, but it's just something that's got to happen. There is a silver lining here. What will happen now is because mum and dad don't have to rear the chicks, they'll breed again. Now that might happen two to three times over the year, and I could end up with six chicks instead of two. Now for a species that's endangered, that's got to be a good thing. What I want to see now that'll make me feel a little bit better is to get these chicks up the top and see them eat. All right, little mateys, time to get weighed. Here you go, just sit in there for a minute. Who's first? Okay, you. I'll tear that back to zero. Sit down, matey. 19 grams. Every day going forward, I want them to be heavier than the previous day. The fragile newborns have to be hand reared because their parents aren't feeding them. Come here, mate. He thinks I'm mum already. That's good. When I have a look at both of them, what I feel for is once they've had a good feed, 
their belly puffs out and it's full, it's full of food. But on these two, I can't feel much at all and that means they've absorbed the rest of their yolk sac. So what I've done is the right thing. All right, now he's 24 grams. The big test now is to see if Tim can coax the vulnerable chicks to eat. My finger is going to be mum or dad's beak. And if they took some feed right now, I would be the happiest man on earth. I'm going to try a cricket. Here we go. Look at the interest. Look at this. Almost, mate. Whoop. Close. Yes, that's brilliant. I don't know what happens in the aviary with mum and dad, but the food we offer, it's just not right for the parents, but it's right for the chicks. I mean, that's brilliant. Let's go for number two. Here we go. You can do it. Yes. That's the best thing I could have hoped for because it's tough taking them from mum and dad. I know I can get them to eat, but when they do it, hey mate, I'm here. When they do it, it makes it all worthwhile. I know they're gonna be all right. One more bit. Wow. All right, little guys. See you in an hour. You're coming home with me. Come on, mate. Hey, hello, little guy. You doing well? Look how big you are. Six weeks later at the Australian Reptile Park, Tim's hand-reared foster chicks are thriving. You're a big boy, aren't you, mate? Yeah, you're a big fella. You're both looking good. Yeah, your wings, they're looking good, pal. It's pretty safe to say that if I hadn't taken them as little chicks, they mightn't be alive today. And who would want that? Have a look at them. The good news is, mum and dad are back on another two eggs. That means the decision to take these little guys was the right one. Curlews in some parts of the country are endangered, so they'll play a pretty important little role in part of a captive breeding program. You know, they obviously can't breed together, so we'll split them up into pairs with other curlews, and maybe their chicks could actually go back to the wild. Fuzzy, look at the camera, look at the camera. At the Bondi Clinic, Quinn and his colourful buddy Buzz are waiting for Chris. What's happened here? I'm racking my brain thinking, is there some rare contagious disease that causes blue, yellow, red, multi-colours across the face? You got a text to fight. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Buzz. Buzz? Like you. Ah, so you want to make him blue? Mm -hmm. Like Buzz. The rare contagious disease that Buzz is suffering from is school holidays. Is he pouring in his mouth as well? Yeah, we had ribs on Friday night, so we've been feeding him the leftover ribs. So he's got he's got one wedged right across his back teeth, across his top palate. I'm thinking that Buzz should be the hairdresser trying to get a tint to change that colour of his, but no, it turns out there's a medical problem here. I'll try to get my finger underneath it and flick it out, but it's in a tricky spot. But it's not actually the first time it's happened. Mm. So dog. he's a very pretty dog, but he's not very smart. <laughs> Oh, 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 bro, it looks like you're going to break it. No, that's not working. It's pretty firm, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's so firmly stuck, it's not going anywhere. It's either forceps or Buzz is going to need a sedation. It should be fairly simple. Got it! Not yet. There we go. Oh, well done. Oh, oh, yay. Oh. <laughs> the moment I flick that bone out, Buzz thinks, well, bone is bone. Don't eat it again. You, you just, no, don't, come on. It's almost as if Buzz is trying to create more medical drama for himself, just so, well, he doesn't have to go home and face Quinn. No, no, you had one go, it didn't work out, so let's not go again. Oh. Buzz is probably only a year old, but he looks eight. He's been through so much trauma. Are you going to ride him out, are you? Yep. Gently now. Gently. Good boy. Woo Enjoy. Buzz, if you're watching, there's a thing called Christmas holidays. They go for about six weeks. When you see that tree being put up with all the sparkly things on it, run away quickly. Don't look back.
just when Chris thought his day was finally over, suddenly there's a strange animal emergency down the street. Oh my God. I had to look once, twice, three times just to make sure I am seeing what I'm seeing. But definitely there are two dogs standing up on the top of a roof, 20 metres high. I don't know if they're stuck or what. If they were to slip, they'd be dead. No doubt about it. Hello? Hello? Why are you laughing? <laughs> Those are my dogs. They're, they're on your roof? Yeah. <laughs> That's where they do their exercise. I'm frantic, breathless, panicking. Walk to the front door, hoping to avert tragedy. And I'm met by Philly, who's laughing in my face. Oh, you want to show me, do you? Come on, let's go. I just think up ways of, like, keeping them happy. So I go, like, while I'm cleaning the house, I let them, I shut them up in my attic, and then they can run all over the roofs. I was expecting I'd be on the ladder right now, calling Triple O, telling the fire brigade to get here quickly. Try to talk down some sort of very delicate emotional situation in two cattle dogs, but no. Instead, I've got to go home and put myself into a delicate emotional situation over what I've just seen. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the Bondi Vet YouTube channel. Click on the screen for more great content and for free, exclusive, never seen before Bondi Vet stories. All you have to do is sign up to bondipet.com and you can do so via the link in the description.